I'd imagine that there are some people who feel they just fit in. They fit in socially. They fit in the way in which they think, the way they look, what they value. But there are many people who don't fit in, in some ways or in all ways. And in full candor, which is what I try to provide here on this show, How to Do Life, is that I generally don't fit in. I want to tell you a little bit about me first and how I don't fit in. And then I want to praise those who don't quite fit in, lest we become like the 1982 Apple commercial where everybody is in this gray suit just marching in uniform. And this is true whether you're conservative or you're liberal. I grew up in a Jewish tradition in which one of the most valued attributes was the ability to see the other side. And you got praised for presenting a view that was not the standard mainstream. So you would say, yeah, on the one hand is this, but on the other hand is that. That's why one of the reasons why so many Jews are supporters of the Palestinians. It, it reflects their ability to be, what the Christian term, ecumenical, be able to see all sides. So that's how I was started. I was praised for always seeing the other side, as long as it was intellectually defensible. And as I've gotten older, that has become suffused in everything. I'm always seeing another side, and I get annoyed, sometimes angry, sometimes furious, when I see the media present one side and presenting the opposite side or another side only as a whipping boy, a straw man to be torn down. Because I do believe that wisdom does reside across the ideological spectrum. And apart from the political, you know, there is a way of being in the world that is considered acceptable. And there's very little tolerance. The very same people who say they celebrate diversity are the same to be judgmental of somebody, not just if they're not politically aligned, but if they are too aggressive or too reclusive, not social enough. Too enthusiastic. Remember, even the, the Democrat, Howard Dean, in 2004, when he had won the Iowa caucuses, and he went, woohoo, or something like that. That was seen as over-enthusiasm, and that killed his candidacy. Is there not room for people who are more intense like me, or more re restrained and more reflective, rather than in the middle, mildly perky and happy and you know, everything's fine. And what about people who aren't interested in the latest and greatest rock band or movie or TV show or, but love the classics? Whether it be classic movies like The Sound of Music or conversely, given the Christian Judea, Judea, Judaic dichotomy, Fiddler on the Roof. Or instead of listening to Beyonce and saying, oh man, that's cool. I love that she stood up on the police car and sunk the, the, the cop car, but would rather listen to Barbara Streisand or Diana Ross or even, heaven forbid, Robert Goulet. Most of you probably don't even remember who that is or heard who that is, but Google Robert Goulet in videos. You'll, you'll, he's a wonderful singer. fashion. You know, there is also a narrow range of what uniform you can wear. If you're here in Berkeley or Oakland, it's cool if you wear really dull colors and even a Mao hat. But if you're wearing bright perky colors, you're seen as shallow. How shallow is that? How intolerant is that? How not inclusive is that? And then on the other end, I've never valued looks. I've always wanted to value being being appreciated for my substance. I threw on a college shirt now, but I was toying with wearing a t-shirt. But I thought maybe it was the first show of the, the new season I would quote dress up. You'll never see me in a tie though. But there are some people who say it is just not worth the effort. And I love Mark Zuckerman, the head of Facebook's philosophy. He's got about 18 gray t-shirts and that's what he wears all the time so he doesn't have to worry about clothes picking things out 
he correctly views that there's more important things to do with their time. On the other hand, my wife is an absolute fashionista, at least in the classic style. She spends a lot of time picking out her outfits, her shoes, her hair, her makeup, her earrings, her scarves, all the rest of that stuff. It's not my way, but there is something about aesthetics and beauty that can be honored too. So there's room for, for both ends. I mean, think about the importance of beauty in the world. There is so much lack of beauty, so much harshness right now, especially around the political. And also, especially around COVID, we're all so damn serious, understandably, but they can't take beauty away from us. Whether it be the beauty of a painting or of a flower, of a beautiful woman, which I consider one of nature's most beautiful forms. What else? College. We live in such a damn brand name society, whether it comes to the brand name college you go to or the car you drive or the Faconable label on a shirt. But if I have a, an, ex, an area of expertise, it is in evaluation of education. And the designer label colleges, certainly, of course, the piece of paper that has a designer label and diploma, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, even Northwestern or whatever, adds value. Because we live in a brand name society and the employers say, well, this must be, he must have been or she must have been smart to get in. So even if the education was theoretical and abstract, as most research universities like the designer label schools are, were not that useful, they're at least smart and driven enough to have gotten in. Unless they were either uh, uh, hired some private consultant that pulled strings where alumni pull strings, or they were of a certain demographic that the university seemed to want. There's this major lawsuit uh, of Asian students suing Harvard for reverse discrimination. That the, if an Asian with the test scores and grades of a uh, African American, average African American admitted student, were uh, uh, that student would have like a two percent chance of admission whereas the African-American student had a good chance of admission. And that anti-meritocratic view is something that is also, I am out of the mainstream. Right now we are all focused on, as the New Testament says, the least among us. But I profoundly believe that society benefits most, no matter what iniquities have occurred to African-Americans or to Jews who have indeed been oppressed from the, from the Inquisition through the pogroms, through the Holocaust, through the rampant anti-Semitism in Europe now, rather than asking for reparations in terms of reverse discrimination, the wisest thing we can do is to truly net, we benefit more by focusing on choosing the best man or woman of the job of whatever race, but not reverse discrimination, not additional redistribution by race. So those are out of step views. I do want to talk about a little bit more about the uh, craziness in my view of this brand name thing, this brand name desire. This is the mainstream being in step would be s s lusting after a Mercedes or a BMW or a Jaguar. In fact, they break down more and require more servicing than the far less expensive and sexy Toyota or Subaru or even Honda. It is crazy, especially in these COVID economy times where so many people need to pull in their belt that people would waste their money on a designer label college when in fact starting at a community college where the instruction is much more likely to be practical and teaching oriented. Why people would spend the money on a private college, let alone remotely with all this remote learning, where at least the, the, the former benefit of going to a prestigious college, the major benefit was living for four years with the, quote, best and brightest. Now that's even gone. I don't, I'm shocked that, that um, parents haven't sued, haven't formed a class action suit to demand a 70% reduction in the tuition. I think Northwestern offered 
big deal. A tuition of, you know, all in cost for a year at, at a brand name designer label school is like 70 grand. Is taking some courses remotely worth anywhere near that? And again, but there is this fear, this designer label thing. The parent of a kid who got into Stanford says, oh, I, I don't want him, I don't want to get him in trouble. I don't want to feel like I'm a bad parent. I'll pay the stupid money. The truth is, if you take a Harvard or Stanford caliber kid, you lock him in a closet for four years, he's going to do a lot, or she, of course, is going to do a lot better than a kid who, uh, uh, you know, than an average kid, no matter what. It's not the college, it's the kid. And paying that, that huge amount of money, devastating family's financial security, and believe me, the financial aid isn't, isn't enough in most situations. Much of it is loan that has to be paid back with interest. My PhD is in the evaluation of education from Berkeley. I've written a number of books on the subject. And there are a few things that I'm sure of that even if you're an Ivy caliber kid starting at a community college, taking advantage of honors programs, taking the best professors, getting involved with extracurriculars, and then maybe transferring is the smart way to do it. Not just in terms of money, but in terms of learning. Sure, there's an advantage, as I said, of, of getting into a designer label school, of getting a diploma that says Stanford or Harvard on it. But that can be compensated for by the quality of your learning, by the quality of your applications. You may get fewer interviews with a degree from a no-status university, but you'll get enough. And then once you're hired, it's going to be you, not so much the piece of paper. It's certainly, there's an advantage to the piece of paper, but it isn't worth what it is. The four-year cost, assuming you even graduate in four-year cost at a Stanford sticker price is $300,000. That's crazy. That's a crazy amount of money. Speaking of crazy amount of money, another example of being out of step is the status of, of a, a, a fancy neighborhood. The actual degree, amount of additional safety, pleasure of talking with your neighbors, etc., that comes from living in a neighborhood where the average house is $1.5 million, and in the Bay Area there's a ton of those, but the benefit of that as compared to living in a more modest area, I'm not saying in a war zone, but in a very modest area, is small. That single decision to live in a modest cost area, to pay, pay small rent or buy an inexpensive house, can offer you enormous degrees of freedom in terms of what career to pursue, how hard to work, what you want to do with work-life balance, and yet people are so driven by the thought that, oh, I'd like to live in Piedmont, or I want to live in Pacific Heights, or I want to live, live in, on, the, on the peninsula, that they really sacrifice way too much for being in step. That's what we're talking about here. How wise is it to be in step? Should we not praise the many people who are out of step should you not in yourself honor yourself, feel good about not being a lemming, following in, lock, in lockstep, walking through the conventional wisdom of life, but rather doing what feels distinctive yet still ethical? Uh, when I come back, I'm going to talk about, um, about the politics some more, how to stay sane when you are out of step, um, what you can do as an individual group, what you can do to grow, uh, and then a final story. Stay with me. If you're listening to this podcast, welcome back to How to Do Life. I'm Marty Nemco. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit more about politics and being out of step. We are, there is a tidal wave, they used to call it the blue wave, but it doesn't have to be in terms of that. But there is a blue wave, there is a, a, a absolute, the, the conventional wisdom now is we must redistribute yet more to uh, the poor, people of color, uh, Palestinians. And I, 
it is beyond the scope of this particular show to talk about the pros and cons of each. But what I can say is, if you are at a step with that mainstream where you believe that there may be better foci and that maybe there is something that, that the, cop, the cops are perhaps more to be defended, you risk so much in this, in this era in which if you dare disagree with the orthodoxy, we've seen videos of it, we, but we hear about it informally all the time, you are going to get, if not yelled at, forced to take a knee as they, they show all those videos of uh, people in restaurants where the, quote, social justice warriors force them to take the pledge that they are, they are guilty of white privilege and that black lie and they should that silence is violence and they need to agree with that or they or the social justice warriors won't leave them alone it is dangerous and it's i wouldn't say it's as far as the, as the uh, the nazi repression but this kind of censorship is what was was typical of the Stalinist era of repression, of the Inquisition when the Spanish did it about the descent from Catholicism, and yes, what the Antifa, Black Lives Matter type activists are demanding of us. And frankly, many in the media will not allow you to have the, the kind of dissent to dissent from the orthodoxy, from the politically correct orthodoxy. I will admit to you, I have a troll who every time I dare say something that doesn't follow the orthodoxy, I get slammed. And she, and I'm quite sure it's a she, she's anonymous, but I'm quite sure it's a she, will do everything she can to get me taken off the air, fired, whatever. And she succeeded. Who knows? Maybe she'll, she'll be listening to this and succeed and get me off the air by saying, you know, all you need to do is f find little scintillas of statements taken out of context unfairly. He's a racist. He's a sexist. And I imagine would threaten the state. Said, do you really want somebody who could be accused of that? Because in this era of censorship, in this era of mob the mob, saying those kind of things can put a station in trouble. Is this a society we want? There is benevolence across the ideological spectrum, from the left to the right. And we must allow, as the universities had for generations proclaimed, that we need the free marketplace of ideas so that the best ideas from left, from right, can be expressed. We talk about wanting freedom of expression, the free speech movement. But how can we have a free speech movement that, that absolutely won't tolerate free speech, that squashes it with social media, where one single person can get a bunch of aliases and claim that, see, there's this groundswell of hatred about this person. How many intelligent people I know, benevolent, who want a better world, but whose view of what is a better world is conservative, or at least not as liberal as the social justice warriors would have us believe, have been absolutely censured and censored into retirement, early retirement. That cannot be good for a society. So to those of you who choose to take the risk of not being following like lemmings in the mainstream, whether it be about politics, whether it be about your values, about materialism. And here is where I'm, I'm quite a liberal. I think we, we give up too much freedom of what we want to do as our career by chasing materialism, as I said, whether it's cars or brands of jewelry or clothing, fancy name vacations, fancy neighborhoods. But if you are brave enough to stand up for anything ethical, that even if it's out of the mainstream, I, for once, believe you deserve to be praised and feel great about yourself, much more so than the lemmings. And I, I've ignored the, the, the male bashing thing here. We are in an era where it's perfectly fine 
to to ridicule men every commercial every every sitcom every movie every play treats white accomplishment white male accomplishment as if it's mainly a function of privilege not about hard work or intelligence And we sit silent. I challenge you. Listen to any commercial. Watch any sitcom. Watch any movie. Watch any TV series. Disproportionately, you're going to see the men, especially the white men, portrayed as either evil or idiots. And yet, most men are afraid to speak up. Because they've been so conditioned to believe that, yeah, men are the inferior sex. Men have their failings, women have their failings, individual men have strengths and weaknesses, individual women. This generalization across a gender, generalization across a race is very dangerous. And I'll be honest, I think the media, the mainstream media should be ashamed of itself for presenting such a, a bias. I mean, even look, look what's going on with the Supreme Court justices now. Nobody even questions when, when Trump says, it's going to be a woman. And when Biden says, if I'm elected, it's going to be a black woman. What would you say to all of the meritorious people who happen not to be a woman or a minority? Is that fair? To them, is, it that, is that fair to society? Is society not better when we get the best man or woman for a job? But we've come to a place where Republicans and Democrats alike are willing to be, to do what what we are in a previous era would have called racist and sexist, saying, I'm going to choose a woman, or I'm going to choose a man, or I'm going to choose a black, or I'm going to choose a white. That is what racism and sexism is. Society is best when we choose people and allocate resources based on who will do the most good for society. Sound bites like, we need more women. We need to have proportional representation. No. We need to, in whatever job, if it happens that there are more women as teachers, could it be because they're more nurturing and better explainers on average? We shouldn't try to make an equal number of male teachers. Or let's say in physics, there happened to be an overrepresentation of Asians. Should we deny the most worthy Asians of that job as a physicist? so that we can have more people of, of, of underrepresented minorities? Is that going to create better green energy? Is that going to create a better birth control pill? We do best net when you consider everything. When we choose the best people, man or woman, white, Asian, black, Native American, Muslim, Jew, Christian, what, atheist, whatever, because everybody can choose to be a victim. Everybody has a case for victimhood. From Irish Americans who who suffered the potato famine and suffered prejudice, Italian Americans who suffered, blacks who suffered, Chinese Americans who were forced to build the, the railroads as slave labor, the Japanese who were in internment camps, the Jews with the Inquisition and the pogroms and the Holocaust. Short people are prejudiced against, fat people are prejudiced against. Once you allow anything other than merit, to enter into decision-making, you are taking a step toward the dissolution of society and turning us into a backward nation and a backward world. Okay, we have a few minutes left. What can one do about if you're out of step? How do you deal? In addition to as an individual, taking pride in your individuality, although, of course, I'm not saying be different just to be different. Somebody who's got nine piercings and, and, and tattoos all over her body just to look different and purple hair spiky, spiky purple hair, you know, it's fine, it's okay, but make sure you're being different because it authentically feels right, not just to get attention. So, but in addition to honoring yourself for authentically held being, authentically held differences, being out of step, it is for many people. Some people are, are quite reclusive. They like what I call solohood. They like spending a lot of time alone. But most people are social. And it is very hard for somebody who is out of step to uh, feel comfortable in these mixed environments. 
I don't mean racially mixed. I mean, if you are, for example, a conservative politically, and here in the Bay Area, almost a, you know, a large percentage of people are liberals, or at least profess to be liberal, or, or even more socialist. You know, and they're going to be all talking about you know, Black Lives Matter, implicit racism, legacy of slavery, reparations. And you know, if you don't believe in those things, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You either have to have duct tape over your mouth and feel frustrated, or you speak up and you risk great censorship, losing friends. I know somebody who lost her best friend because of a political dispute about all this. So you've got to find kindred spirits. So if you are uh, taking, you know, if you're a hard leftist, there are communist and socialist groups here. There are candidates from, you know, uh, in, and I would even say including Biden and Harris, who's, you know, Harris, who's got a, who's quite a liberal at, at her core, notwithstanding what the media says. But finding somebody who's you know, like I think Biden-Harris, supporting a, a Harris campaign is going to get you with lots of leftist kindred spirits it, or some any kind of liberal group. And if you're conservative, there are, and libertarian, there are still are meetups and conservative and libertarian groups. The fastest way to do it is to simply Google libertarian group or conservative groups, Republican groups. Republicans are not Nazis, although some of the leftists would have you believe that Republicans are Nazis. So find kindred spirits. Reading-wise, you know, there are relative, you know, Hollywood is so monolithically leftist. There's, you know, outside of Braveheart or whatever, there's, there are very few conservative movies. So a conservative is going to have a hard time finding much in the way of reading beyond novels like Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead or periodicals maybe your best shot the national review is mainstream conservatism reason magazine and on reason.org is a, uh, a libertarian website would be a good source and of course liberals have no trouble finding uh, things to read read the new york times the uh, the new yorker watch cnn watch pbs uh, you'll ha you'll find plenty of kindred spirits there in any way i just want to end by saying uh, i have the greatest respect for people who, in their attempt to be benevolent and authentic, are out of the mainstream, whether it's because they like to look schlumpy or because they don't follow the standard uh, Bay Area and media uh, belief in that liberal is right. In any event, I, this is Marty Nemco reminding you that we find comfort among those who agree with us, growth among those who don't.